Hey all, welcome back. So this is lecture four of our World War II series. So four of seven. Today's about the Holocaust and the devastating effects of the Holocaust, uh, not just in Europe, but worldwide and sort of what are the influences? How did we get to the Holocaust? What ended up happening? And then what is the legacy of the Holocaust too? So our day in class is gonna be focusing specifically on the Holocaust. Uh, we'll hear a survivor's story. Uh, as well. Uh, we've been reading Mouse to kind of understand sort of the ramp up of persecution that's going to happen to people of Jewish ancestry, as well as other undesirables, undesirables as uh, targeted by the Nazis as they take power in Germany and occupied territories in Europe as well. So grab your notes. Again, this is lecture four of seven. So we are over halfway there, halfway complete uh, through our World War II lectures. Thanks for tuning in and, and taking care of them. Hopefully it's been informative to you and brought up questions that have sparked you to research. Uh, just so you know, there will be some uh, graphic pictures. Uh, so you could always turn off the video and just listen to the sound. But here's some uh, pictures of the Holocaust, which you've probably heard of before and understand to a certain degree. This is the gate that enters into Auschwitz, which becomes the largest killing center, extermination center uh, in occupied uh, Poland. And uh, the wording is Ar Arbeit mach frei, which I know I'm butchering in German, but work makes you free. Okay. And originally it was a work camp that turned into uh, an extermination camp. And here's uh, photos from Americans that are liberating one of these camps. They didn't liberate Auschwitz. In fact, the Soviets did that. Uh, but this is Dachau, which is another uh, camp that was liberated by Americans. And so Holocaust, what does it mean? It's a Greek word meaning to sacrifice by fire. There's this term has been used to mention other massacres in the world and world history. But when you generally mention the Holocaust, it means what happens with the systematic state sponsored persecution and murder of 11 million people that happens uh, during World War II <clears throat> is most generally what this term is. Uh, referred to. This is the eternal flame at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. It always burns uh, in memory of the 11 million people who lost their lives, including the 6 million uh, people of Jewish ancestry that lost their lives at the hands of the Nazis. But it's also going to include the other undesirables, gypsies. This is like a nomadic a people group that have never had a country. So they've been nomads throughout various countries in Europe. They are still around, still exist. Uh, in many countries in Europe, and because they don't necessarily have any ties or pay taxes in many countries, uh, they're kind of made to be the scapegoat for many of those societies and cultures problems, uh, including the Nazis too. Disabled people are also going to be exterminated. Slavic people, as in Poles and Russians, communists, Jehovah Witnesses, and homosexuals, uh, as well as some people of color, uh, make this long list of those groups targeted by the Nazis. So just it's important to say it, before uh, Nazis rose to power, they rose to power in 1933, there was 9 million people of Jewish ancestry living in Europe when the Nazis took over. Again, they're going to exterminate 6 million. So they exterminate two thirds of all of Europe's uh, Jewish population. Okay. And so at the, also at that time, uh, half of the world's Jewish population lived in Europe at that time. They're gonna, Jewish people are gonna be here in America and throughout the rest of the world, most half congregating in Europe. So then the Nazis are gonna exterminate two thirds. Uh, so what is that? A quarter of the world's Jewish population is gonna die during the Holocaust, tremendously uh, high number. Uh, and so uh, here's kind of how things uh, start ramping up. At first, in the mid to late 1930s, there's gonna be state-sponsored racism and boycotts aimed at isolating Jews from society. This is when they start to wear the Star of David to mark them as Jewish in German uh, society and other occupied territories, Polish society. Uh, and so from there, they're gonna start to uh, destroy businesses, destroy synagogues and uh, places uh, where uh, Jewish people congregate. Then for number two in their ramp up is establishing ghettos. And these are places where they're gonna be forced to live and work and separate and isolated from the rest of the German population. Uh, 
and they're eventually going to become walled off areas of major cities. So even if you lived in country in the countryside, you're going to be shipped into cities and live specifically in these ghettos. They're going to be considered like the worst areas of the cities because there's going to be no food and little business uh, coming in. And uh, these people are going to be solely dependent on what's coming into the walls, either uh, by the Germans, which isn't anything, or through the black market and what is uh, basically pirated and brought in. So, and then Jewish people are gonna be interrogated and you start to see sort of their lives devalued uh, to the sense that uh, they can be killed and uh, harmed and homes destroyed, businesses destroyed uh, with no repercussions for those doing the violence and injury against people of, in Jewish, of Jewish ancestry, as well as those other undesirable groups too. So this is by the late 1930s. Then as we get to 1942, specifically, this is when we see phase three, where Jews start to be deported to extermination camps. So there were these concentration camps that were set up as work camps. Hey, you're going to work, you're going to dig, you're going to make ammunition, you're going to make tanks, uh, things to provide support. Um, and Schindler's List as a movie does a great job of talking about this, where Oscar Schindler has this business where originally he's making uh, cookery, like pots and pans and stuff, and then he has to fashion things for war, uh, all the while he's employing Jewish men and women uh, to work in his factories, and he's going to compel the Nazi government and basically say, hey, you need this stuff, I'm providing it through this Jewish workforce, you can't harm my workforce because they're providing things for war. Uh, but we're going to see, again, number three, the phase three uh, Jews start to be uh, transported to these extermination camps, of which there's going to be about a dozen of them. And there's going to be even more concentration camps or work camps. But many of these larger camps are going to be turned to extermination camps, where now uh, people are being uh, placed in trains and, and tra transported to these extermination camps, placed in gas chambers, like you know or have heard before, and exterminated. Their bodies are burned in a crematorium, so they're cremated. And this is a whole process uh, to basically exterminate whole people groups in this plan. Uh, that ramped up from phase one to two to three is called the final solution. It was made by Heydrich Himmler, uh, another a Nazi uh, big wig, uh, and Hitler's obviously going to approve of it, and he's going to, uh, you know, have no problem with what ends up happening uh, to the Jewish people and other Nazi undesirables. And so here's a picture of some of the ovens. Uh, it might be Auschwitz. I can't remember. Uh, where this picture came from but at, after people are deceased you're just putting their bodies in the oven till they burn up and there's nothing left maybe except some bones and charcoal and you just keep this process going uh, and so these crematorium are going to be going 24 7 so are going to never stop burning bodies just because of the rate of extermination that's happening in these camps especially by 1943 1944 is going to be the high point uh, of the killing in these camps. And so uh, really the turning point for the Nazis coming after uh, people of Jewish descent and their und undesirables, specifically though for Jewish ancestry is going to be November 9th to 10th in 1938. This is called Kristallnacht or the Night of Broken Glass is how it translates from Germany, from German. And so this is going to go from you know, separation, some persecution of Jewish people to literally a wholesale. Now we're breaking, purging, burning synagogues, Jewish businesses, Jewish homes. And so now we're just seeing open violence that is not sort of being restrained or stopped or condemned. And so German officials said it was a spontaneous outburst of public rage in response to a murder of a German official by a Jew, which is what happened. There was a, a, a Jewish man working uh, and living in Paris, and he was trying to get his parents out of Nazi Germany. And so he goes into the German consulate in Paris and asks for a visa for his parents. He's denied. And so he goes back basically at gunpoint, pulls a gun on the German official there and uh, shoots him dead. And so that guy's, uh, that consular official's body is transported back to Germany and on a train basically goes throughout Germany and he's hailed as a hero. And sort of, it's a couple of nights after uh, this funeral procession that this crystal knock happens. We have documents and we know it wasn't spontaneous. It was in fact planned. And uh, police around the country were told, don't do anything, don't step in, just allow uh, members uh, of the SS and the Gestapo and uh, 
just sit other citizens that want to express their rage, do what they're going to do. And the Nazis are going to blame the, the Jewish people for the damage caused and start deporting men uh, to concentration camps, not necessarily extermination camps yet, but first to uh, work camps or concentration camps and going to find the Jewish community uh, financial penalties uh, and eventually start move them into ghettos or separate segregated places in cities to live and work. So at this time, there's going to be a lot of people that want to leave Germany, but Germany is going to close their borders. Um, so you can smuggle yourself out. Um, if you could get a visa to another country, then you are allowed to leave. But basically, they weren't accepting any new people <clears throat> to necessarily leave the country unless you had a visa that a country was honoring. And so we're going to have uh, Jewish people get on a passenger ocean liner called the St. Louis trying to flee. And this is a story kind of indicative of even the rest of the world's treatment of Jewish people at the time which it wasn't just a German thing to think that Jewish people are awful. There's going to be anti-Semitism throughout the world, including in America. And so uh, a lot of these people, most of them, had uh, paid a lot of money to a Cuban official to let uh, them immigrate to Cuba. And so they had this visa to leave Germany, which German, Germany honored. And so they boarded the St. Louis, and then they went from Germany to Havana, Cuba, the capital city, uh, and it had 937 Jewish passengers. They find when they arrived that they had purchased false visas. This guy basically just scammed them. Uh, and so only two uh, people were allowed to leave the ships because they had va a valid visa and all that, 135 rest of these family member families. We had whole families, kids included, women and children. Uh, were not allowed to enter Cuba. And so they then appealed to Franklin Roosevelt for entry into America, and Roosevelt did not respond. So we don't know if he got the message and what he said about it because he did not respond. But the St. Louis was forced to go back uh, into Germany. And there were several countries, four at least, that took uh, residents or uh, passengers of the St. Louis back, including Great Britain, France, Netherlands, and uh, I believe it was Denmark. Uh, three of those four countries get occupied by the Nazis, and most of these passengers get exterminated by the Nazis. Those that were in Great Britain uh, ended up surviving. Uh, and so this just tells a tale, like even other countries like America were not accepting Jewish people of Jewish ancestry fleeing for amnesty or for refugee status uh, before World War II. And so where were Jewish people able to go? Really nowhere. They're kind of hemmed in uh, by the Germans and the rest of the world. Who did not want to provoke a war with Germany by accepting all these German refugees of Jewish ancestry as well. So there's videos, we don't have time to go into them, maybe I'll show a couple in class. Uh, so again, phase two is now Jewish people in many of the major cities are going to be hemmed in into what are called ghettos and basically walled off. You know, you're saying you're undesirable, so we don't want you in society, so you're going to live in this section. Uh, but it doesn't mean that Jewish people didn't rise up. Uh, the most famous uprising uh, came from one of these ghettos. It's called the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Warsaw is the capital city of Poland, and it had one of the largest ghettos uh, of all the Nazi-occupied cities. And uh, they're going to smuggle in weapons and guns and, and food, obviously, but it's about 100 men that are going to organize in some resistance to fight back. They're eventually squashed. Everyone is killed. Uh, the ghetto gets burned and uh, hundreds of Jewish people are going to die or be exterminated pretty quickly, lined up and shot or uh, put on trains out of the uh, ghetto. And then what do they do once those people are gone? Well, then they bring in other people into the ghetto from other areas, from the countryside, from new occupied countries that have just been occupied. Great resource for this, these videos is the United States Holocaust Museum based in Washington, DC. It's a great place to go um, to understand the Holocaust too. They have great exhibits. Uh, and then Auschwitz is the most famous extermination camp. Again, there's going to be about a dozen of them. Uh, most of them are not in Germany. I believe there's only one in southern Germany that becomes an extermination camp. Auschwitz and most of the others are in occupied Poland, that it's occupied by the Nazis, Auschwitz included. It's called Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, and it had sort of four different areas. Two of those four areas ended up, ended up becoming extermination areas, but it's the most famous death and concentration camp 
of probably all of them that the Nazis set up. And again, this one's in Poland. Uh, historians estimate that 1.1 million Jews were killed at Auschwitz alone, okay? So, uh, as well as other undesirable people. Uh, and so there's video on it. Again, we don't have time to go in, but this is kind of a similar picture. So this is one of the extermination crematorium uh, sort of bodies are just being buried in these mass graves uh, in just like uh, ashes strewn and stuff, digging these huge trenches. I know it's tough to see. Um, you can look at pictures if you want. And then this is uh, what is the ruins of crematorium number two. Uh, it's estimated that about, about 500,000 people of Jewish ancestry and other undesirable people were exterminated just in this crematorium alone. And there was four crematorium uh, in two different locations of the camp. So this is crematorium one and two, and then another location was crematorium three and four. But this one, number two was the largest. And so 500,000 people, they estimate, was just killed in literally this football field size area. They believe it's the most people ever killed in one spot that small um, over the course from basically from 1942 to 1944. And so it wasn't just people of Jewish ancestry, but here's like a propaganda ad saying, hey, we need to go out and get rid of disabled people that have genetic defects and might sort of infect or infuse um, their genetic identity and defects in the rest of our community. So we can't have that. We need to root it out. So we have this perfect Aryan race. So the translation is 60,000 Reichsmarks, the German dollar, is what this person with genetic defects cost the community during his lifetime. Fellow German, that's your money too. So basically saying this person can't care for themselves. They need the community. They need taxpayer money and others to care for them. So why not just get rid of them and save us ourselves that money and also not have this blot of genetic defects uh, in our community as well. And Germans are, are uh, excuse me, uh, Jewish people are gonna continue to resist, not just in the Warsaw ghetto uprising. Uh, like Danish people were really famous for smuggling. They did like an underground railroad style smuggling operation out of Germany of Jewish people. Uh, and so that was one of them. There's also going to be other sort of resistance uprisings in many towns throughout Germany and other occupied areas. Uh, the French are going to have a, a free France resistance movement, and they're going to rescue uh, hundreds of Jewish people as well. And so there's these stories uh, about um, really heroes that are trying to save Jewish people and other people that are going to be exterminated by the Germans. Um, very incredible stories of valor. And maybe you've read Anne Frank, you know, obviously she did not survive the war, uh, but even her hiding and she had people that helped her hide. Uh, those are heroes uh, included in that as well. So here's just a map. This is Germany, right? So you have all these concentration camps marked by the swastikas, and then the extermination camps have these skulls and crossbones. And again, all of them are in Poland. Here's Auschwitz-Birkenau which I just mentioned, Treblinka is another famous one. Uh, all these are gonna be uh, uh, liberated by the Soviet Union. And so they're gonna tell us, hey, we found all these extermination camps and our initial response is no, no, I mean, Hitler's not even that bad to be exterminating uh, hundreds of thousands and as we're gonna learn millions of people, he couldn't be that bad. Uh, but that is in fact what happened. So here's Bergen-Belsen. This is marked as a concentration camp, but this is really uh, gonna become an extermination camp by the last year of the war as Germans are desperately trying to basically kill off all the evidence of the atrocities they committed. They're just gonna be whole scaling, just shooting people dead. And this is one uh, in those that were living in these work camps, just trying to kill them. Uh, and so this is one of the camps that Americans uh, liberated. And this is when it became real to America that this is what was happening. Uh, and then here's Dachau down here. This is the one I mentioned as well uh, that's going to be liberated by Americans. And this is when the first pictures uh, get started printed in American news. We had some from the Soviets uh, and knew of those stories, but we didn't really didn't take it real until the American press went into Bergen-Belsen in Dachau and could prove that it was happening. So the reaction of the Holocaust, as I said, at the beginning of the war, uh, all the way up till World War II starting, rescuing as Jews was not a priority for the United States. The same thing after the war starts. 
Uh, the State Department made it difficult for refugees, as I mentioned, turning away uh, just like members of the St. Louis Ocean Liner, as well as others that individually were applying for visas and refugee asylum status. Uh, we were blocking them because we were fe fearful that if we did accept them, that it would provoke Germany to be attacking us and our ships um, with the submarines. So we received delayed reports of the genocide, what was happening. Uh, from people that saw it firsthand and maybe were smuggled out um, and, and also stories from the Soviets, but we believe that they were embellished, right? Not even Hitler could be that awful. Uh, so Congress twice is going to reject legislation allowing 10,000 unaccompanied Jewish children into the U.S. So these are children that have been rescued or made it out of Germany before World War II started or somehow got liberated uh, by the Soviets or the Americans that were fighting uh, and so unaccompanied, basically, they don't have parents for whatever reason, probably exterminated, uh, and we are twice going to deny uh, those children to become refugees in America. And then in the last year of the war, we knew of Auschwitz, and I saw a lecture on this, very interesting, of this great uh, killing extermination center, and we didn't make the efforts to go bomb it or to bomb the gas chambers or destroy the railroad lines that went to the camps. Uh, it, it wasn't a military resource is what the United States government said and because it wasn't a resource like we didn't want to waste resources destroying it when we could in the war that much earlier. So our military planners thought that the best plan was just to end the war as quick as possible to stop these extermination camps from operating instead of just going to the extermination camps and spending resources, planes, bombs, trying to destroy them. Let's just destroy Germany and then we'll focus on liberating these camps as there's no Nazis left. So been highly criticized to this day. You know, how many lives could we have saved if we had bombed them, um, but again, was not a military uh, target. So it wasn't that big of a priority. What's gonna happen after World War II is over is what's called the Nuremberg trials where many Germans, hundreds of Germans are gonna be placed on trial. So all the way up from the biggest big wigs, there's 22 like big wigs that were tried and uh, 10 of them are gonna be charged with crimes against humanity and uh, hung to death or executed. And then the other 12 are gonna be placed with life in prison. Uh, some eventually are given release, but it's gonna go all the way down to hundreds of other people. We're gonna check basically everyone that said that they were Nazis, served in the, as a Nazi and just check them out. Some of them are gonna be like, okay, you're just following orders. You were like a Nazi janitor. Okay, we're, we're gonna let you go free. Uh, but many guards are going to be placed on trial too. Some of them are going to be uh, sentenced to years in prison based on the testimony of people that lived through these extermination camps. And then the worst of the worst are going to be executed or placed with life in prison. And so those trials of many of these uh, Nazis that committed war crimes is, is famously called the Nuremberg trials because it took place in Nuremberg, Germany. After World War II, um, I'll probably talk about this in class. Uh, we're gonna see after the Holocaust, like many uh, people of Jewish ancestry are not gonna feel safe returning back to Germany or just going about their daily lives in Germany from a people that ramped up their aggression against them, persecuted them for years. It's tough all of a sudden to flip the switch. Same thing in the Civil War uh, with the treatment of African-Americans in the South. The South just didn't flip a switch and be like, all right, we lost. Yeah, all you uh, people of color, yeah, you're now equal to us. We know that that didn't happen here. And uh, many people didn't think it was going to happen in Germany and didn't happen in Germany. So uh, what they saw for the first time in 2000 years, many Jewish people said, let's go back to our ancestral homeland and sort of really capture a piece of that where we can set up our own Jewish state, our Jewish country, and then we'll be protected. We'll have a homeland where no one can really harm us again unless they attack our country, which has also happened several times uh, since the 1940s. But uh, the United Nations agreed and in 1948 established a Jewish state, a Jewish country that we call Israel. And Israel is still around and was attacked by many countries surrounding it and miraculously kept winning and also expanding territory. It is a country uh, in the Middle East. It's uh, very interesting, though, because it's the only Jewish country in the world as well. It's surrounded by Arab uh, Muslim countries uh, that desire just to wipe it off the face of the earth. Although in the last year, uh, we've seen new peace treaties made with Israel and other countries like the United Arab Emirates, which is a Muslim majority country. 
Um, I'm thinking of there's a couple others that have made peace with Israel and recognized Israel and said, hey, we realize you're here to stay. We are not enemies. We're actually fighting a common enemy, which is the country of Iran that's spreading uh, Shia Islam and then spreading terrorism throughout the region. So we'd rather ally with you, Israel, than uh, continue uh, to be attacked by Iran. So, and President Trump and his administration put together a lot of those deals and he was just nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize for it. I don't know if he'll get it, um, uh, but so that was something that has happened in the last two years, which is interesting and we'll get into as we go forward. So, okay. So that ends really our conversation, the Holocaust and, and sort of the legacy of the Holocaust. Uh, again, we'll watch a survivor's testimony and then sort of talk about the implications of the Holocaust in class when I see you next time. Or really, we've already talked about it because you'll see this lecture after we've done those things in class. So, but thanks for tuning in. We'll see you soon.